We are on now. Okay, we are on. <clears throat> Everybody got a copy? We are the uh, First Southern Baptist Church of Yucca, and we are currently in the book of Hosea on our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, tonight's title is The Judgment of Israel. <laughs> Of course, it seems the entire book of Hosea is about the judgment of Israel. But each, have you noticed that each little chapter is a little bit different? I know they're talking about a lot of the same things. And it seems like if you don't really study it, that it's just repetitive. It's over and over again as God lays out his case against Israel. But you find out a little bit more each time. And, and you start seeing yourself a little bit more each time because I'm telling you right now if this didn't have something to say to us right now yeah in our day and age or through the ages I should say uh, God would not have put it in his work Amen. but we can learn from the things that were happening in ancient Israel uh, today and it's pertinent today uh, the thing that's the most pertinent right now is that we ourselves are getting ready to uh, go into an end time scenario, that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Yeah. And while we're reading about some horrific things that are going to happen to Israel, let me tell you, it's nothing at all like the end of this book. <coughs> it is nothing at all like the revelation uh, that was given to the Apostle John of Jesus Christ. When this world comes to realizing who God is, uh, literal monsters are going to come out of the deep. Uh, the, when God comes against uh, this world, you're going to see a lot of things happen that weren't going to happen to uh, ancient Israel. They're going to get attacked by Assyria, and yes, some horrific deeds are going to happen, but their, their water is not going to turn red. The stars aren't going to fall from heaven. No, the, the list goes on and on about the things that's coming to this planet. So, people get ready, as was my song I sung last Sunday. Uh, we don't want to be in that particular number. We want to be in the one that gets raptured. So, pay attention tonight as we look at God, as God brings judgment against Israel and see if you can find ourselves, Because only in finding ourselves in the scriptures written thousands of years ago will they become pertinent. Let's read Roman numeral number one. <clears throat> What's your... Look at the heavy... Look at what? What about it? 91-1-17. Oh. <laughs> Okay, we have a dash in there that should be there. We didn't even proofread it. Doesn't make any difference. We have a load of lumber that was being delivered. We just barely had time to staple it and get over there to watch them unload the last piece. <laughs> oh, our God is a God of love. However, He is also a God of judgment. Much in the same way as a father corrects and chastises a disobedient son, God chastises his creation. Now the question would be, why does a father chastise his son? Because he wants to make a better man out of him, right? I mean, I don't, I don't want to say every father's that way, but that's what a good father, and we're putting God in the realm of good fathering. And God's chastising his people for the same reason. He wants to make better people out of them. And through both his love and his dis discipline, God can, and of course will, make Israel a better people. In the end, Israel will rule planet Earth in truth and righteousness. But in the days of Hosea, they were in line for a big spanking from a loving father. That's true. You read the end of uh, Ezekiel, and you'll find that the after the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Israel comes through and they rebuild another temple. 
not not the one that goes through the uh, great tribulation. That's that temple will be lost and torn down. They will build a new temple, and they will go in and do the right things in the temple. Everything they do will point to Jesus Christ, and uh, Jesus will, of course, sit on that throne, ruling in in uh, uh, the seat of David. Um, where was I? Tonight's study is in the ninth chapter of Hosea, and it's a list of the punishments that Israel, God's disobedient child, was about to receive. As we would say to our disobedient child, here is your punishment for what you did. But dad, all I did was steal the car and took a joy riding. Okay, well, for that son, you're going to not get the car for three months, two months, whatever that punishment's going to be. And, and this is what God's, that's tonight's study. It's a list of the judgments that God's going to levy against his people Israel. And he's not just going to take the car away from them. Okay? Uh, he's going to take their identity away from them. He's going to take their land away from them. Uh, he's going to take their babies away from them. Yeah, that sounds kind of harsh. Um, one thing you don't ever want to do is fall into the hands of the true and living God in the wrong way. Okay? When you meet him, you want to meet him on the praise floor. You know? yep. And you don't want to meet him in the disciplinary area in life. Uh, as we said, here is your punishment. God is saying to Israel, here's your punishment. And he's saying through the prophet Hosea. Now, here's the thing about tonight's study. Many commentators, and I sort of go along with their idea, but there's no actual proof of this, what I'm going to say, believe that this uh, lesson that we're given tonight, it's called an oracle, uh, was actually given by Hosea on the threshing floor uh, during harvesting season. Uh, I don't know where these commentators are getting their proof. I think it's just because it's referring to the threshing floor situation so much during the, uh, the ninth chapter. Uh, but it would have been a great time to have done this, but picture a great joy and celebration, but it was momentarily paused with God's word coming into these people of judgment. The picture is like this. The people are having a standard Jewish celebration on the threshing floor. The threshing floor, so we understand tonight's lesson, was the place where they took the grain, and it was usually up on a hill, uh, and they would toss the grain up into the air. The wind would come along and blow the shaft away, and the grain would fall on the floor. It also, they, they had a big um, celebration also when they scrunched up their wine. So these places where they were harvesting different things, they were celebratory times for Israel. And so they're all celebrating. They're in there having a joyous time on the threshing floor. They don't even know their sin because they're giving credit on God's threshing floor to Baal for all the grain they've got. That's what their hearts are doing. Uh, because they've been into pagan worship. And here's God, the God who is really God. He sends Hosea in and says, By the way, people, you're all going to go into judgment. Assyria is going to be here in a very short time. And here's what's going to happen to you. Here's the judgment that the true and living God has pronounced against you. Yeah. Now, if that's not a picture of the world in which we live. Here it is, world, you know. I know that guy just kicked a field goal, but here it is, world. Uh, here's what's really happening in the world in which you live. Yeah. There's soon going to be a man rising to power. It's going to be one world nation and domination. Uh, and unless you have Christ in your life, uh, you're going to be going through some really hard times and he's going to, if somebody like that picks up the book of Hosea, he's going to say, wow, it was sure easy back then. Yeah. Compared to what's really coming yep. to a theater near you. 
So, with that, let us get going and let's see what God had to say through Isaac, Hosea. Do not rejoice, <laughs> O Israel, with joy like other people, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. The fleshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. Verse 1 and 2. A lot there. Don't rejoice. That's what I was just saying. Uh, here, comes, here comes this ominous looking dude called Hosea. And he's coming in. He's seeing everybody having all this fun and joy. It's harvest time. They're throwing the wheat. Hey, what's up with you guys? Don't you know God has judgment coming your way? Yeah. And let me tell you about what's going to happen. We're going to get into some parts in here. They're going to look at him like he's a weirdo. Like he's got three hands. Yeah. Uh, it says, For you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on the threshing floor. I don't even want to go into that verse. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing. Except they're having lots of babies. And God calls them the, the product of harlotry. So that's not good. Um, and he's talking also about the wine press. And, then, and they're saying... That that's feeding them. They're giving credit to Baal. Uh, the, remember, we went studied this way back when we first started talking about the harlotry of Israel, and Baal was was that god that they looked to, who gave them their sustenance. Baal was the one who, through his uh, temple prostitutes, would populate the yeah. the world, and so Baal got credit for babies being born. So keep that in mind when we start talking about what God's going to do with the babies. And the new wine shall, shall fail in her. Uh, they're going to continue drinking old wine because it, the new wine's going to fail. And they shall not dwell in the Lord's land. Again, I want to keep the picture in front of you. He's walking into the threshing floor, the place where they're having this great big party, and he's saying... You're not going to dwell in your land anymore. Okay? But Ephraim shall return to Egypt. Now we've talked about this several times in the last couple of weeks. God is saying he's going to send Ephraim back to Egypt. But we all know that Israel never went back to Egypt. In fact, it even says in here that they will go into captivity in Assyria. So that is, Egypt is a symbolic of the world. Do you remember the study of Joseph, yeah. where uh, actual God the Father was portrayed as, as the Pharaoh in the land? And of course, Joseph was a uh, type of Christ. But when they were in Egypt, they were slaves uh, under a hard taskmaster. And God's going to send them back into Egypt for the next 2,700 years, and even to this day, uh, the Jews have been under a harsh taskmaster. That taskmaster is the world. Okay? And you shall eat unclean things in Assyria. See, there he's telling them where they're really going to go. They're going to eat unclean things. They shall not offer the wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. Uh, they're they're going to want to continue to do the things that Jews know how to do. They're going to continue to bake bread and offer that bread to the Lord. They're going to continue on occasion, maybe, to sacrifice an animal so that the sins will go into that animal. But God's not going to retake their sacrifices. It says, they shall not offer the wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall uh, their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread, the bread of mourners to them. Uh, Mourners were the only people allowed to touch dead bodies. And when somebody had to touch a dead body, yet it was absolutely forbidden in Israel to touch a dead body. So the mourners would touch the dead bodies, and they were ceremonial, ceremonially unclean for a certain period of time when they touched a dead body. Uh, 
But it's going to be like bread of the mourners to them. You couldn't eat the bread of the mourners because any bread that they would give you would be ceremonially unclean. So a Jew would understand that line quite easily. Okay. All who eat of it shall be defiled. So if you ate of the defiled bread of a mourner who touched a, a dead person, uh, you're going to be defiled. And God says, for the bread you're going to eat is going to be just for your life's sake. You for think that they uh, brought in Gentiles to remove those bodies? Uh, they could have at some point in time, but they did allow for mourning, mm -hmm. and the mourning had a certain period of time, even though that, it, I don't want to go too deep in it, but there was times when uh, they were unclean. Right. And while they, when they were unclean, they just had certain rules and regulations they didn't have to follow. Uh, for their bread, it shall be for their own life. Now, see, the idea here is that when, they, when you bake bread, it's kind of like we do when we say our grace and we thank the Lord for... Uh, the Jew would actually offer some of that to the Lord, okay? And set a little bit aside for the Lord. You're, and, and of course, in the temple, each tribe would bake a certain amount of bread, and every week the bread would rotate, and the uh, Levites and the people that worked in the temple were allowed to eat the showbread. You remember the time when, when David went in, and he ate of the showbread that was in, in, right. yes. in the temple, because he was hungry. Uh, and Jesus defended that, by the way. Uh, it shall not come to the, uh, and it sh the bread shall not come into the house of the Lord. Uh, we talked about this back a few chapters ago where they were going to be taken into captivity and they were not even going to be recognized as Jews any longer. And to this day, they're, the, they're known as the lost ten tribes of Israel, correct? Well, let's read what I wrote here. For Roman numeral number two. The picture is one of mass joy and displaced gratitude to the one, capitalized one, who actually called for the celebration. It was God who set up all these, these uh, celebrations of the threshing floor. In fact, it was on a threshing uh, floor where uh, Ruth came and asked uh, Boaz. Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer. And of course, that is a picture of Jesus Christ on the threshing room floor accepting Boaz's wish. And that became Boaz's wife. So Joe Boaz, of course, is also a type of Christ right. who became the kinsman redeemer. Uh, these people were going to the threshing floor and giving praise to Baal, not to God. God calls this harlotry. Okay? And states, you have made love for hire on every threshing floor. Threshing floor was not limited just to one part of Israel. It was all throughout Israel. They had many threshing floors. And throughout Israel, they were all doing the same thing. So God very clearly tells the people, do not rejoice. Why? Because that joy is about to end. This chapter is about judgment. And that judgment is just around the corner. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail her. Soon and very soon, the crops are going to fail. Israel will be expelled from the land and be symbolically sent back to Egypt. It's important that you realize they're not going back to Egypt. I'm not saying that there's not Jews today in Egypt. Um, there are, but they were, it's, it's, this wasn't the time when they went back. They will no longer be treated as God's people. In fact, they will lose their identity as God's people, and even to this day, they will be known only as the lost ten tribes of Israel. The bread that they bake will no longer be offered to God. It will be only for their own life. And the sacrifices that they, that they offer will not be accepted by God. The sacrifices will not come to the house of the Lord. The end of the good life in the land of milk and honey are coming to an end. Now think about that relevance in the world today. You know, you guys all remember that, the Happy Days show? We can look back in our life and say, yeah, things were a lot simpler back yeah. then. Didn't, didn't they seem simple back then? Yeah, they of course, did. that's because a lot of us, you know, we weren't having to take care of families or anything like that back then, you know, but the happy days uh, are coming to an end right here in 
the good old USA. We weren't and necessarily happy days for our parents and grandparents. <laughs> no, they weren't. They just come through World War II, but our parents had this desire just to give us something more. We had, they came out with uh, all these household things that made cooking better, and life better. We had TV for the first time. We had microwaves come in the first time. It was to go down to Disneyland, you would, you would see all these inventions uh, in, in the 50s um, that now are antiquated, you know. Yeah. And this is a dial-up telephone. <laughs> and kids would never figure it out today. They not have a clue when they dial. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 I don't have a full clue what the other ones are. Um, <laughs> The days of happy days are, are coming to an end in this nation, and one nation under God is about to fall into God's wrath. I don't know what's going to happen. I really, really don't. But even good old Biden made the mistake of saying he's into this whole new world order thing. Mm -hmm. Just the other day. Yeah, he's going to when he's awake. You know, he grew up in a middle income family, so yeah. he knows the yeah. struggles. So Hosea 9, 5 through 6, God asks the question, What will you do in the appointed day? And in the day of the feast of and in the day of the feast of the Lord. There's there's a, a good question. What are you going to do? Okay, it's it's 14th day of Nisan. You're, you're a Jew, you grew up as a Jew, and you're it's the 14th day of Nisan. What are you supposed to be doing on the 14th day of Nisan? You begin Passover, okay? The Seder but meal. The Seder meal, yeah. Uh, you're going to be in Assyria. You're going to be in captivity. What are you going to do? And God's just throwing in their face. What will you do on that appointed day? You okay? can't do nothing. That's yeah. slaves. Uh, and what are you going to do on the feast, on that appointed day? He's referring to the day you're going to be taken into captivity. But uh, what are you going to do on the days of the Feast of the Lord? For indeed, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. What's Egypt going to gather up? Everything you've got, including your heritage. Uh, and he's going to refer to the town of Mes Memphis shall bury them. You know what's in Memphis? Elvis is great? No, no, no. I think it's, uh, <laughs> Memphis is the place where they have all the tombs. <laughs> cemeteries, big, big. They have tombs, cemeteries, and pyramids. They were really into burying people in Memphis. And that's where the great pyramids are. Uh, nettles shall possess their valuables of silver. And gold and silver and thorns shall be in their tent. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting that um, they're going to die off as a nation. Don't even know where they're at today. And nettles and thorns are going to be in their path. Doesn't this sound like the proclamation that God made back in the garden? Yep. To and it's almost like they're being sent back to the garden, but they're being sent back to Egypt. That's far enough and close enough. It's, it's kind of what he said to Adam and Eve. Yeah, it's real simple. to when God cursed the earth. God begins these two verses with a question: What will you do? In the appointed day. That's kind of the question that we need to get out there to this world because we're not far away from that appointed day. Yes. What are you going to do when everything falls apart? So many of these people out there are just gonna, they've been storing up uh, ammunition and uh, food. And I'm not saying it's not good to be. Uh, Prudent, the Bible teaches that we should be prudent, but they actually think they're going to muscle their way through this thing called the Great Tribulation, even if they believe that there's one coming, and most of them don't. Right. Most of the people out there today, even the people that we align with politically, okay, are putting their hope in, in the new election, uh, the, the one that's only months away and then the one that's uh, a couple years away. That's where our, our hope is, okay? I mean, that'd be nice if I'm still around. I, I like that. 
But they're not thinking about what, what God says in his word. They're not trying to... Don't get me wrong. It's sort of a joke. Sandy keeps saying, I'm, I keep trying to set a date. I'm never setting a date. I know, that, I know you can't set a date. But it is sort of fun. And I say fun. Uh, going through scripture and digging out scriptures and, and seeing, seeing what scripture has to say about this or that. And all pinpointing... Uh, where we're going to stand in the rapture. My whole series on Sunday is about that. And that's what we've been studying. You know, the Matthew 24 thing. Uh, but we at least are aware that it's coming. And what we need to keep in mind what Peter said. And Peter said, knowing these things, what manner of person yeah. ought we to be? And that should keep us on our on a repentance need <coughs> constantly. That doesn't mean you have to crawl around on your knees. It means you need just to be aware when you're not acting godly. We need to be aware when we're doing something that God wouldn't approve of because he said he'll never leave us or forsake us. And every sin that we commit, we take Jesus with us. He, he's living right here. His spirit is in us. We, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as such, the Church of Philadelphia, that's what, that's the one I want to be in. Uh, I don't know if they'll hire me as a pastor, but uh, that's the church I want to join. I want to make sure I'm in the Church of Philadelphia, because all the other six churches get passed up. Why? Because they're really not a church at all. They're a, they're a heretic church. Every one of us want to think, oh, we're in the right church. You know how you get in the right church? Act the right way. That's right. The church I think it's also important to remember what we learned in Revelation when you went through that study, which was that there was, <clears throat> even in those other churches, there were true there believers were. I'm glad that were going to be saved. Because right. if you're going to say, six out of seven of the churches, boom, you're, no chance, no way. Right. That's not what the Bible says. Because it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Yeah. And so... I was reading that this week. It goes... It, it, yeah. I'm glad you remember that, because that is so important, that you can be sitting in a bad church. Yep. And, and you can be sitting in a church that you don't... You totally would disagree with our theology. But guess what? You're in tune with Jesus Christ. You talk to him every day. You've got that relationship going, Okay. Um, and you and you begin to see right or wrong. I don't mean right or wrong theologically, and you come and start agreeing with Pastor Wayne or whatever. You know, I'm talking about you begin to see what God wants you to see and act like God wants you to act. Um, churches in the building. Churches in the building. The church is here. Or a denomination. And and when God's talking like this, all those people that are doing things the way God would have them to do. Those saved people in, might be sitting in an unsaved church. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Glad you brought that up. Um, I would be quite arrogant if I said, oh yeah, everybody that goes to my church, we're going up in the rapture. I would, I would be so blessed if that was the case, but I can't make that dogmatic statement. <clears throat> no. I don't know where everybody's heart is. I got a big sign up there that says, I'm not even supposed to question where their heart is. Okay. Kathleen Joe used to say, it didn't matter what flavor you were, you're only there's only two choices, up or down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay, where was I? Oh, the point of day. For indeed they are going because uh, because of destruction you gather. Okay, God begins these two verses with question. What will you do on the appointed day? Everything that they were going that were rejoicing over will be gone. Look at our society today. There is more joy and excitement over a football game than there is in a Sunday service. I don't care if you like sports or don't like sports. Um, I don't care if it's racing, boxing, football, basketball, or what it is. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying a, uh, a game of some sort, okay? But... When that's taken precedence over your relationship with Christ, 
You know the main reason people don't come to church on Sunday? Mm -hmm. They don't have time. Don't have time. They yeah. don't want to change. Well, why, why don't they have time? Okay. It's my day off and I just want to stay my in day off. Give me a break. People will become, become lovers of themselves, not lovers of God. That's yeah, what the true. Bible says. You know, in the day of Jesus, and right up until really the 1900s, you know, when you went to work for a man, you worked uh, six days a week, had Sunday off, and were expected to be in church. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And when you worked, you worked from uh, sunup to sundown. It, was, it wasn't any of this eight-hour stuff. And they still took their Sundays, or their, for the Jews, they took Saturdays, and that was a day that they would uh, not work. Mm -hmm. Think about this. We always want to put all these rules and regulations on. The Sabbath from God, hey, I got a good idea, you guys. Why don't you take one day a week off? Right. And just yeah. bask in me and refresh in me and get ready to go and hit that, that job Yes. Uh, all charged up because God is a charging station. And yeah. That's why you guys are working Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> I had a boss that once said, if you could do what God did in six days, then you could have the seventh day off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it lasts long in that job. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong or bad about sports, but when sports replace the one who gave us the freedom and spare time to participate, then there is, in fact, a problem. Also, whenever an attitude, I'm sorry, whenever an athlete momentarily gives credit to God, he's seen as a weirdo in the eyes of the uh, joyous fans. Remember Tim Tebow? Yes. yes. You know, he would stop and give credit to every pass he threw, uh, you know, that came out right or whatever. At the end of the game, if he had a good game, he would be up there in front of people and he'd be saying, uh, Jesus this and Jesus that. Uh, society pinned him as a weirdo, yeah. you know. Uh, they had to get him out, out of those sports no matter how good he was. Yeah. So people will say, oh, he wasn't that great of a quarterback. I watched him. I thought he was a good quarterback. You know, he was playing baseball but, for a while. Too. Yeah, he's a good athlete. He, did you know that he was to be uh, aborted? Yeah. Yeah. The story of the story of his life and his mother chose it last minute. Anyway, Tim, I hope you're online. Yep, uh, <laughs> he is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so God says to Israel, "Indeed, these days are gone. Uh, Egypt, the world, <laughs> shall gather them up." The days. Memphis was a city in ancient Egypt that was famous for great cemeteries, tombs, and pyramids. All represent death. Memphis, the term, he said that Memphis, Memphis, Memphis shall bury them. Not another good picture. Needles and thorns, we talked about those are the product of sin. These were the promised fruit of the earth after sin entered into the garden. Israel's wealth, prosperity will be gone and their gold and their silver will be replaced with needles and thorns. Nettles and thorns. Which are nasty when it's wet and you get stuck. Verses 9, 7 through 9. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows the prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane. That's kind of like what I was talking about earlier. I can remember in my own, in my personal life, and I've shared this before, watching people down in the parking lots of Fred Myers up in uh, Grants Pass, Oregon. People going and putting little stickers on the cars, and I'm going, yeah, they better not put one of those on my car. I don't want one of those little stupid stickers. Look at those idiots out there. Jesus freaks. Call them Jesus freaks. That's now, and I remember when I came to the Lord, uh, and this guy that led me to the Lord stubbed his toe on, I was in prison, on a metal bed post, and uh, it started bleeding and everything. And, and this guy jumped around going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
And I thought, wow, I just accepted this guy. Sure hope I don't become a guy like him. <laughs> I, you think these people are fools, okay? And I can remember thinking that. And maybe some of you can too, you know, before. <laughs> Greg Lauren was like that. Yeah, Greg Lauren was like that. Uh, but the spiritual man is insane. Of course, that's a uh, back on when they thought that David himself had to play insane. Remember that right. story? Yep. Uh, the spiritual man is insane, and, and this uh, Israel knows that the prophet, the one standing in front of us, says Hosea, and that's him, is a fool. So he's, he's bouncing off what he's seeing these people thinking about as they're rejoicing. They're going, what are you talking about? You know, what, what do you mean? Got all this food and yeah, look, Baal has blessed us so much. What are you talking about, Yahweh? Well, we, we do his feast. We have fun at the feast, but then you're way off base. We're going to give credit and glory to Baal because he hands us all the naked women and we get to go do anything we want to do. That's a good God, right? Yeah. No, says the Lord. <clears throat> the watchman of Ephraim is with my God. He's calling himself... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, because of the great, I left the line, a spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your inequity and great enmity. Where have we heard that word enmity before? There's enmity between the people now and God. That's what, that's what uh, God said to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. And that was the first prophecy of, of the coming of Christ. Jesus was the seed of the woman, of course. Um, the watchman of Ephraim is with my God. He's talking about himself. But the prophet is a fowler's snare in all his ways. Enmity in the house of his God. They are deeply corrupted, okay? As in the days of Gibeah, okay? Anybody know that story? We're gonna go over to just a minute. He will remember their inequity. He will punish their sins. So here's the prophet standing in front of them. He Now he's, he's saying to them, you're all a whole bunch of corrupt people. You're more corrupt than even the, the days of Gibeah. And in those days, and you can read about it uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in, here we go. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's in Judges. Yeah. Judges, 1930. Uh, 19 and 20. But it's a horrible, horrible story. I went back and reread it, and I've read it before, and, and it's a horrible story about... Uh, Benjamin comes into a house, he, he wants to uh, actually have sexual relations with the man in the house, but the guy offers him his, his concubine, and he takes the concubine, and, and when he brings it back, the man in the house takes the concubine, dismantles her entire body, and takes little parts of her body to all the people in Israel, said, look what the Benjamin did, and it turned into this great big Why internal civil war. That? It's in the Bible. Well, I'm not coming up with this on my own. And it's in the Bible. There's, some, there's, there's a lot of truth. This really happens. It's, it's true. And, and of course, Israel thinks this is the worst thing, worst crime that has ever happened in the nation Israel. They united against the Benjamites and uh, the Moabites and, and the, anyway, the all the Ikes. And it was a horrible story. And here, this man standing in front of him saying, this is what's coming upon you because you're corrupt in the same way as in the days of Gabeah. Yeah. And they all knew, what are you talking about? We're not that bad. We're just some fun-loving people down here yeah. throwing, throwing stacks of hay in the air and rejoicing over the fact the ball gave us a bunch of food. Wow. Didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue. However, the man of God, Hosea, continues and he refers to... Oh, wait a minute. As we stated earlier, most commentators believe that Hosea gave, gave this oracle 
while he stood on the threshing floor amidst the celebration and the false joy coming from the people. Imagine the response of the people when he says, the day of punishment has come. And there's a typo. The, no, the days of punishment have come. Okay, I'm right. They most likely were laughing and treating Hosea as a fool. You did it right, Wayne. Yeah, and saying this, uh, this spiritual man is, an, is insane. The same picture was given to us in the story of Noah and the flood. Yep. Even Jesus said in Matthew, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in yeah. marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Yeah. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. By the way, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but when you're reading further on in Matthew 24 and you see one will be taken and one will be left, yeah. and he's referring to this scripture right here, what happened to the people that stayed? They got taken away. Who stayed on planet Earth? Noah. Noah oh. and the family. Mm -hmm. So the pig, if God, Jesus, people take that wrong. They think that's a picture of the rapture, and it's not. However, the man of God, Hosea, continues, and he refers to himself as a watchman and one who catches their sins as a, as a fowler's snare. This is a picture, of course, of one who catches birds in a trap or a snare. His job as a prophet is to inform God's people that they are deeply corrupted. And he points to a time in Israel's history of a horrible rape and murder of a young woman by the men of Gibeah, an event that even started a civil war. Israel saw this event as one of the worst crimes that had ever been committed in the history of Israel, Judges 1930. This story could lead us into an entire study in the book of Judges. Uh, I mean, you start reading this stuff and you just almost can't put it down. Uh, uh, and I encourage everyone to read chapters 19 and 20 of this book. Refresh yourself on that, that horrible story. I know you're going, why am I talking about this? Because uh, sometimes the Word of God's not all that clean. It's telling the truth, and there's been a lot of evil perpetrated on planet Earth. And God wants these people here, at least, to understand that what they're doing is as bad in the eyes of their Creator as were the Benjamites who came to the door of the servant of God. The point that Hosea is making is just this, just as God remembers the men of Gabeah and punishes their sins, God will equally punish Israel for their sins. For well, an enmity in the house of God means that they, Israel, are completely separated from God, just as the seed of Satan was completely separated from the seed of the woman in the garden. You don't want to have enmity between you and the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now we come to a little tear time. God's now looking at his people, speaking through Hosea. And he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Piar and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they, they loved. Yeah. Start this over again. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Grapes don't grow in the wilderness. But when they accidentally do, and you've been wandering around the, this desolate <coughs> land for a while, and you see grapes growing in the desert, that's kind of a cool thing. You know, you're, you're wandering around in the desert, and you find grapes growing on the vine. Yeah. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. I'm not a, a horticultural type of guy, but some, something tells me that what God's saying here is the first fruits off the tree in his first season are really good. In fact, they're a delicacy. And this is what God saw in Israel as they were a growing nation. 
He looked at them. He's he looking past their sins. He went down to Egypt. He loved them with an outstretched arm. He called them his first son. He called them his wife, Israel. That's what this whole story between Hosea and her wife is about. He loved Israel. But here's the line. But they went to Baal, Yair, Yor. Baal, Baal, Tiar is the place, of course, where they worshipped Baal. And Baal was the antithesis, the exact opposite of God. I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. He is the anti-God. Baal was really no God at all. He's, he's a symbol. He's something that they think was a God. But they worshipped him as if you could worship an orange. He was a nothing, yet they would worship this idol. Um, he was their fertility god. He was also their abortion god. You could, they would make his statue red hot. And if you had an unwanted baby, you could just come down to one of the worship services of the Baal and just put your baby on the arms of this red hot God and it would kill the baby. That was their form of abortion. Israel was an abomination to the God who served them. They became like an abomination, like the thing that they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Though they bring up their children, yet I will grieve them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. Just as I saw Ephraim like just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre, God dem demolished Tyre, yeah. uh, planted in a pleasant place. So Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderers. There's a good line. Why is Ephraim? That's Israel. Why are they going to bring out their children? To the murderer. Who's the murderer? Who's coming after? Assyria. Assyria. Assyria had a way of conquering <coughs> that was not nice. They literally skinned people alive. This is the this, these are the people that God's going to bring against His people. They literally skinned people alive when they went into a uh, situation where they took captives. They killed all the children. No soldier is going to take care of a bunch of kids whining and crying and babying them. So they kill all the babies. They only keep the ones alive that can work and serve their purpose. Yeah. They're the conquerors. And the, the horrors of, of the Assyrians has probably never been matched. See, and, these stories like this, at least in my, my life, are the stories that when I tell people about the Bible, they mm -hmm. tell me these horror stories. Yeah. By the way, a if he's such a good <clears throat> God, why did this, you know, and yep. those are actually what's fed back to you by people. <coughs> you betcha. Are, why would God want people to go into a land completely annihilated? Don't we have a word for that? Don't we have a word for somebody that goes Russia? and completely takes yeah. out another race of people? Russia? Hmm? Genocide. genocide. Why would we serve a God who would genocide people? And you can't understand. If you start somebody in the beginning of the Bible, say, come here, I'm going to work on a Bible study. We're starting Genesis 1 1. Yeah, that's not. Don't do it. If he, start. If he, Don't do it because you will not understand it. If he sends you to it, he will pull you through it. Yeah. Go to the John. Go to the John. I used to tell people. Yeah. Don't even go to Matthew, Mark, or Luke first. Go straight to John. You'll fall in love with Jesus. Then go back, read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, and John again, and do that several times through, and then go on to the book of Acts, and you'll see how the church grew. And then it's time to go back and understand from where the church came. The church came from that. Okay? The church came from that sacrificial system. The church came from the law, which said that you eradicate all sin from your presence. We don't have to worry about that. We can say, Lord, I'm sorry. Okay? And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Mm -hmm. We don't even have to take a little bird or a lamb down to the priest and 
and sacrifice and put our hands on and say, here's my sin. Going in. We don't have to do any of that anymore. It's ununderstandable. You, you couldn't even explain why you have to sacrifice a lamb. I only got 10 minutes here. I can move. Uh, Take your time. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them, just as I eat from like tiger, plant in the present. So Ephraim will bring out his children to the murder. I can almost see a tear in the eye of Hosea as he reports God's love and despair for Israel. They were like grapes in the wilderness, uh, a refreshing thing to find in the desolate land. They were also like the first fruits of a fig tree, a delicacy or, or a treat. I got this underlined. But they went to Baal. The are. Yeah. Wow. Kind of like Adam, if you think about it. Yep. He had everything. He had everything. But he decided to do things the way he wanted them done. Typical man. And this is another whole story. <laughs> By the way, the story of Baal Peor is found in Numbers 25. It's a story of God's people under the leadership of Moses who joined themselves in pagan worship with the people of Moab. This, this incident led to the death of 24,000 Israelites who went over to uh, Baal Peor and became idol worshippers. God is saying that through Hosea, that just as those offenders were an abomination to him, also, the people of Ephraim are an abomination. As punishment or judgment, their glory will fly away like a bird. Let me go back to um, Baal Piar. Then there, these people were all dying because God had put a plague, caused a plague to fall on the entire uh, nation of Israel. 24,000 people had died. Then one and mostly because the priests weren't doing anything about it. The leadership were not doing anything about it. Then Phineas, you remember him? Yeah. Phineas, this, this young Midianite lady, uh, or a young, young Jewish man, comes to the door of the Temple of Meeting, where Moses sat in there, and his priests are sitting in there with him. And he brings with him this Midianite woman who, of course, was from Baal Peor, yep. to say, hey, look, Moses, isn't she beautiful? And, uh, why can't we just have relations with these women? Up jumps Phineas with a spear, and he runs both of them through right. with the javelin, right through and kills them both. Yeah, these are not the stories you tell of new beginners, okay? <laughs> and, you know, to us, we're looking at this story, and we're going, well, what's the deal? But after that, God released the, the plague because Phineas was faithful to God. Yep. You had to get rid of the sin. Yes. And Baal PR was nothing but sin. God says, I looked at them like they were, like they were the first fruits of a beautiful fig tree, but they went to Baal PR. It wasn't just Phineas that ran that lady and man through. That was God. Yep. It wasn't, it wasn't some Noah that caused two million people to drown in the flood. It was God. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, well, anyway, it could go on. I only got a few minutes. <clears throat> Where was it? First thing will bring out is Jacob's children. First thing will bring out his, Jacob's children to the murderer. The murderer will be the Assyrian army and they will kill all the newborn babies. This was one of the unthinkable horrors of the Assyrians. They killed all the children of the people they conquered. Remember these children were, by the way, the byproduct of harlotry, and they also fell under God's punishment. We have to remember where God takes children, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so they went home. They went home. Yeah. God's in charge of life yeah. and death. We, we, we want to stop with our responsibility on this side of eternity, but we know that God... Is responsible. We don't know at what point they are, but he's surely not going to let them grow up in a pagan household. No. Not, he's sending these he people away. Now Hosea, listen, Hosea just had to say what was going to happen. The murderers are going to come out and kill all the babies. Hosea has, by the way, some children of his own that were by the by harlotry. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He had three through just by. Um, 
By Gomer, yeah. You had uh, uh, Jezreel, Lo Rumaha, Lo, and Lo Amin. Yeah. Those three. Uh, so he prays, Give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. He's basically praying, Don't give them children. He couldn't bear. He's there. He's a father of these same people. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them, says the Lord, because of the evil of their deeds. I will drive them from my house. Now he says, I will love them no more. All their princes are rebellious. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. God is not meaning what he said. I'm sorry. Yes, they, yes, were they to bear children, I would kill the little darlings of their womb. Not something you want to read to the new believer. You have to understand what the, reper, what the repercussion of sin is. And when, 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 they, would, when they would slay the, the sacrificial animal at Passover, I've, I shared this with you before, the kids would go out on the 10th day of Nisan and they would pick the, the cutest little lamb, at least one year old, from the, from the herd. And they would keep it in the house. The children would name it and all kinds of things and, and have fun with it. And then on the day of Passover, the father would grab, put all the children around, would grab the lamb and slit the throat of the lamb in front of the children and say, see children, this is what sin causes. Yep. You see, children, this is what sin causes. And only, only an, uh, an adult Christian can understand what we're talking about. Sunday school yeah. only give you New Testament. Yeah. It is. It, it's really. Yeah. Hey, I get calls from Janice all the time. Janice couldn't have her kids doing any of this no. stuff. You know, they wouldn't understand. Yeah. She is working on. Um, she called me. She's doing the. Uh, thing about uh, sacrifices, why Jesus had to die. It's a hard one to explain to a child. Yeah. You know, why did Jesus have to I don't understand. Most baby Christians don't understand. I, okay, I gave my life to Christ, but run that by me again. Why did he have to die on the sin, on the, on the cross? Yeah, so, so it didn't make sense yeah. at first. So, yeah, me. <laughs> this verse begins with a plea from Hosea to to God. Hosea asked God to give the women a miscarrying womb and dry breast. Hosea previous words must have been hard for him to speak, telling the people that the children would be killed by the attacking Assyrians. So he now begs God not to even allow those children to be born. The question is what would cause a loving God here's the question to do such a thing? Answer these are the children of harlotry as we have already stated and their sin was committed in Gilgal, where they were harlots, basically. Basically, God's saying the nation had it coming. Remember, Hosea was going through the same pain as God was in these verses. And in these verses, God says, I hated them, and I will drive them from my house. Additionally, God says, I will love them no more. Here's where I say, God, you know what? You're just, you're just mad. Calm down. Do you remember the names of Hosea's children? Uh, children go uh, through, Gomer. through Gomer. One was named Jezreel, meaning judgment. And one, one was judgment is coming. One was named Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy, no love. And the last was named Lo Ami, which means you are not my people. But the very next verse, after talking about the names of the children, these are the harsh words, but they are not the final words, nor the true heart of God. And in the end, God will restore and revive his people. We studied that just a few weeks ago. Remember, in two days I will, I will revisit you, in three days I will revive you. They, they then will serve him even into eternity. Here's this quote right after, in, right after the names. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sands of the sea. In other words, I'm going to bring you back. 
He said, I'm not going to love you. I, I can't stand you. You're out of here. It's, it's a picture of an angry father. He said, get to your room. You know? No, you're not. Now you're not getting the car for three months. Okay? Stay there for four years. <laughs> yeah, stay there for four years. Stay there for 2,700 2, years. I'll see you in the end times. And that's exactly what God said in, in the prophecy of the two day and three day. We studied that for two weeks. In conclusion, let us read. My God will cast them away because they did not obey him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. Oh, by the way, people, enjoy your harvest. Enjoy your threshing room floor. I've said what I want to say. In conclusion, Israel will be cast away because they did not obey him. Uh, him. Who does God think he is? God? <laughs> is this not the same God who cursed all of mankind simply because he disobeyed his maker? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Is this not the same God that we call a loving God? There must be something deeper in its meaning. What are we missing? The God I know so loved and not so hated the world. He sent his own son into the world that the world through him could all can be saved. God knows that the price or the wages of sin is death. So he knows if he doesn't get his people straightened out, they're going to really and truly die. And I'm not talking about just dying to death by the Assyrians. I'm talking about a death eternally. He's got to get these people squared away. Why? Because he loves them so much. God knows the price wages of the wage of sin is death, and he has made the path clear for all of us to follow. We even study these ancient scriptures which are given to us through Hosea that we might learn and then repent for the sins which we ourselves are committing. Remember, just as if in the days of Hosea, judgment is soon to come upon not just us or our nation, but to the entire world. We are reading Hosea tonight. We are studying Matthew 24 on Sunday. We are looking at end time scenarios. And we are looking at the consequences of what's going to happen when we go into the book of Revelation. And we see the horrors that are coming at us and been prophesied for over 2,000 years to us as Christians. We can see these things. And God wants us to use these things, if nothing else, to scare us into repentance. Knowing these things, what type of person ought we to be? And that's something we need to ask ourselves all the time. And if if I don't scare you, the Holy Spirit will, because he's living right inside of me. Yes. <clears throat> you know, sometimes sometimes I accuse myself of being ins insane because the, 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 the description of insanity is one who repeats the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Stupidity. That's, that is the description. I can vouch for that. But I don't think so. I don't think so with my con God has really blessed me with, with the congregation here. Um, in case you guys haven't noticed, when I get up there on Sunday, or even tonight, I'm very serious about this coming home to your heart. Yes. And when I'm doing that, I'm not just pointing my finger at you. It's coming right back at me. And we are living in that time where we need to get serious. Not that we don't need to get serious at all times, because any one of us could flop over dead, and then we meet our maker. So we need to keep it in front of us. But when we, when, just don't die dead, yeah. Thank you guys for tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, don't let this message tonight gain any uh, dirt and then grow grass on our feet. Lord, we need to take it into our heart. If not even for ourselves, but for others, Lord, that we know that are perishing. Yes. There's a bunch of people out there on the threshing floor watching football games and, and enjoying uh, life, which is fine, but with no reality of what is coming our way. 
Politicians won't save them. Wealth won't save them. Only you can save them because of what you did on the cross. Lord, I'm praying that you turn this little town of Yucca into a town of worship for you. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.